Luke 24, starting at verse 36. When they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while it was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And that's where we'll stop today. So, here in this passage, these two disciples come back and they say, we've, we've seen him. He is alive. We actually saw him. And, and while they're telling him about this, Suddenly, Jesus just appears right there. In, in uh, Jesus' resurrected body, he has a way of getting around that, that uh, is a little, a little better than the ways that we get around. He has this way of just appearing. We're going to talk more about that in, in coming weeks. But verse 37, it says, They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. Well, the disciples were were really freaked out when they first saw Jesus alive. This was very, very startling and very shocking for them. And you have to remember that, that people, I mean, we know that people rise from the dead. For them, they, they had never seen or really had, didn't really have much precedent for this before. And especially, especially somebody who had been beaten to a pulp and crucified and died. Just somebody who was just a total goner. I mean, not just didn't, Jesus didn't just die peacefully in his sleep. He was killed horribly. And now they see him better than he was before. So this would be quite a, a startling thing. I mean, we've, we've been to funerals. We've, we've seen people that we've known and loved in, in the caskets there. And, and can you imagine seeing that person suddenly alive and well? It'd be pretty startling. Especially somebody who didn't just die, die peacefully, but somebody who was beaten so bad that he was unrecognizable. And now suddenly he appears better than he was before. Verse 41, And while they did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They had, they had difficulty believing their own eyes. So, so Jesus is there and he's like, um, No, it's, it's really me here. You know, look, touch me and see. And, and it says they, they still didn't believe it because of joy and amazement. It was like, this is too good to be true. Is too too good to be true. They couldn't even believe their own eyes because it was so amazing. Well, it's not any different today, really. Jesus' resurrection is is difficult for many people to believe. It's it's not something that that's that's easy to come by. I mean, if you think about it, none of us have seen somebody rise from the dead. We've never seen that happen. 
That's kind of a difficult thing to believe. We have to believe in something we've, we've never seen. They, they got to see it with their own eyes. We, we have to take it on faith. So I just was looking around and I thought, okay, I wonder how many people actually believe in a resurrection. So I, I did some digging around. Americans who believe Jesus rose from the dead. Well, in 2013, 64% of Americans believe Jesus rose from the dead. And the, but in 2012, it was 77, so there's kind of a downward trend. I was kind of hoping for a 2014 or 15, but there wasn't, there wasn't any. So we have, we have a, a majority of Americans who believe that Jesus rose from the dead, but that's a, that's a lot of people who don't. That's a lot of people who don't believe it. So I was doing some more digging, Maybe you've heard of a, a church called the Church of England. It's the, the national church in uh, Great Britain. It's, uh, it's an Anglican church. And uh, a third of the pastors in that church don't believe in the resurrection. A third of the pastors in the Church of England don't believe in the resurrection. And here's... Here's a, a retired bishop in the Episcopal Church. His name is John Shelby Spong. And uh, I think I have his picture up here. Yep, okay. Let's, let's look at this. I'm not having you write this down because this is a bunch of baloney. But I want you to read this because this is a real person who's a leader of a real church who really thinks this. I don't think the resurrection has anything to do with physical resuscitation. I think it means the life of Jesus was raised back into the life of God, not into the life of this world, and that it was out of this that his presence, not his body, was manifested to certain witnesses. So we've got this mystical resurrection. It's kind of a pseudo-resurrection. Because it couldn't, because scientifically, I mean, we can't really believe that that people come back from the dead? He goes on here. What the resurrection says is that Jesus breaks every human limit, including the limit of death, and by walking in his path, you can catch a glimpse of that. And I think that's a pretty good message. So, so just the, the notion that Jesus could rise from the dead is, is something that says, well, we can, we can transcend our human limits. That, that's what this is about. Really? That's a pretty good message? Yeah, it, I think that, that's maybe about it. It's just a pretty good message. Okay, well, the Bible, this passage that we just looked at today, today's passage really drives home, Jesus really rose from the dead. This was not made up. This was... For real. And if the disciples were standing here now, right here today, if if this was if this was that time, they they might say something like, I I know it sounds crazy. We could hardly believe it ourselves. I mean, they had him right in front of them, and they they, they could barely believe their eyes because it was too good to be true. But this whole passage, they were not hallucinating. They were not seeing a vision. Jesus is not a corpse resuscitated. They thought they were seeing a ghost. They saw him better than he was when they last saw him. And so they thought, well, this, this isn't just, he didn't just sort of die and then just get, got back up like he passed out or something. No, it's like, this, he must be, this must be a ghost. Because he appeared to them better than he was before. And then, to prove that Jesus is saying, um, no, not a ghost, not a ghost. Jesus is not a disembodied ghost. He had flesh and bones. He, he had flesh and bones. And He proved it to them. Verses 39 and 40. Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. 
A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And when it says he showed them his hands and feet, the, the Greek word there actually means he proved it to them. So, so look, here, here, touch, touch, see? Real. Yeah? So they, they, they touched him. One of the other passages you're going to read this week in uh, your Bible reading tracks is the opening passage of 1 John where it says, That which, we have, which is from the beginning, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have heard, which we looked at, and our hands have touched. We touched him. He's real. It wasn't like some sort of hologram where we could kind of stick our fingers through him. No, no, we touched him. He really came back from the dead. And when they still didn't believe it, he ate food in front of them. Do you have anything here to eat? Because if he was sort of just kind of an invisible, ghostish sort of a person, then he wouldn't be able to take something physical and material and be able to chew it and swallow it. If you could put your hand through him, he wouldn't have been able to do that. So he had a piece of broiled fish and he ate it in front of them. He's proving to them that he's real and that it's really him and that it's not a vision. So he actually rose from the dead. What does this mean? What does this mean? It explains it to us here. Verse 48. It just says, You are witnesses of these things. So these disciples, they had walked with Jesus for three years. They had they'd seen Him die, and, and now they'd seen Him rise again. They'd seen Him do all kinds of miracles. They'd heard Him teach. They'd seen it all. They'd witnessed all of that. He said, okay, you are witnesses of these things. They were to tell about Jesus since they had witnessed everything about Him. So they had, they'd seen all this happen. Now it was on them to tell other people about it. The, these are the greatest events of history. And they saw them firsthand. I mean, most of us watch the news or have seen the news. And, and what is the news? There's reporters that find out about different things that are going on. Some good, some not so good. And they report. They say, okay, well, this is what happened. And this is what one person said. This is what another person said. And, and they just report on a story. Well, that's what, that's what these disciples are supposed to do now too. This is Jesus Christ. This is who He was. This is what He did. This is what happened to Him. And this is how He came out in the end. So a question for us. What are we witnesses of? What have we seen God do? What in your life has God done? Do you, do you just say that you believe in God or, or has He really shown up in your life somewhere? Some questions to ask, ask ourselves here. Where would you be if you didn't believe in Jesus? Who would you be following if Jesus wasn't your Savior? Where would your trust be? Would it be in yourself? Would it be in some friends you have? Your job? Family? Whose instructions would you just kind of follow instinctively? What would you be obeying if Jesus wasn't your Lord? What passions would dominate you? What group pride would define who you are? What fears would control you? What would our life be like if we didn't have 
a Savior to make us right with God. And we had to earn God's approval. What would life be like then? What prayers have you seen answered? I mean, we all pray and ask God for things. What, what prayers has God answered in your life? What coincidences have happened after you gave something over to God? We are witnesses of God's activity too. We, we're not the same witnesses that, that uh, these disciples, we haven't seen everything that they've seen, but we've seen God work. We've seen God be real in our life. We have something to say. The, Jesus Christ is newsworthy for all people of all time. So verse 47. Repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in His name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. What Jesus did is for the whole world. It says it's going to go to all nations, starting at Jerusalem and then fanning out from there. Jesus didn't just come here and die and rise again for, for himself, or not even just for the people of his own time. It's for all people of all time. People need to know about that. Just one, one thing that this does, since Jesus conquered death, I mean, when we died on the cross, he, he defeated death. All people will rise from their graves when Jesus returns. So, if you think of an aquarium, you think of a hole in it, Jesus broke that hole of death, so now all the water is going to run out. There's a hole in the dike. And the question is now whether we are going to rise to eternal life or rise to eternal punishment. This will be another one of your Bible readings this week. Because Jesus conquered death, all of us are going to rise from our, our graves. Whether we are in Christ or not. Those in Christ will rise to life and those rejecting Him will rise to eternal punishment. This, this is for everybody. What Jesus did has implications for everybody. Everybody out there. It says, repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in His name. We have some things that we need to tell some people. Repentance is first. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection mean these two things. Number one, repentance. We must repent and change from our ways. Because, because He lived, died, rose again, ascended, we have to change. This is the part we don't like so much. We kind of like things the way they are. We kind of like our lives to be comfy and cozy. But really, because of Jesus Christ, we need to, we need to turn around. We need to change. Look at the screen here with me, if you would. Can those be saved who do not turn to God from their ungrateful and impenitent ways? By no means. Scripture tells us that no unchaste person, no idolater, adulterer, thief, no covetous person, no drunkard, slanderer, robber, or the like is going to inherit the kingdom of God. We can't just assume that, that God doesn't care about what we do. We're saved by grace, but that doesn't mean we can do whatever we want. We need to turn from our ways. And if God gives us a heart to love Him, we're not going to want to do those things that bring disgrace to Him, that hurt Him, offend Him. And so we are going to live new lives. 
So we need to repent. But that's not all. It's not all about just changing our ways. There's repentance and number two, there's forgiveness. God will actually forgive even our worst offenses. So we have to change for sure, but we are saved by grace. God forgives us. And this is something that, that we've heard many times, but, but it's easy to still walk around with guilt. It's easy to get weighed down by our mistakes. And we need to always remember that our God forgives us because of Jesus Christ. Look at the screen and answer the question with me, if you would. What do you believe concerning the forgiveness of sins? I believe that God, because of Christ's atonement, will never hold against me any of my sins, nor my sinful nature, which I need to struggle against all my life. Rather, in His grace, God grants me the righteousness of Christ to free me forever from judgment. All of the things that, that we've done, all of our sins, they, they deserve to send us to hell. That's, that's the way it works. But because of Christ, we don't have to worry about that. We can be forgiven. We can forgive ourselves, and we for, can forgive others too. One more thing in this passage that I want to point out. Verse 49. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. He's talking about the Holy Spirit, which would come upon all of them at Pentecost. They were to stay and wait for the Holy Spirit. So, he gives them this big assignment. You've got to preach to all nations. Starting here in Jerusalem, preach to all nations. For, preach repentance and forgiveness to all nations, but wait. He says, he says wait. Wait until you've been clothed with power from above. They had to wait for the Holy Spirit Everything that we do for God must be done by His power and on His time. There's times, I mean, we have, as a church, as believers, we have an important message to carry. And we have lots of people that we need to talk to, but we need to be patient. We need to wait for His time. And as, as a church, there's, there's important things that we need to do in this, in this neighborhood. But we need to wait for God's time. When we, when we jump the gun, when we get kind of antsy and say, oh, I, I just, something's got to happen, I just got to do something. When it, when it comes from us, it's going to fail. When we go by God's power, it will succeed. But if we act on our anxiety, being impulsive and such, that's not going to work. I was talking with somebody just, just yesterday about, about looking, for, looking for a new job. And uh, this person said to me, you know, I was, I was looking for a new job, something that, something that was going to pay me a little more and, and, uh, and be, be, a better, be a better fit. And, and I was looking and looking and I, I just wasn't coming up with anything. Nothing was really working. And so I just decided, you know what, maybe this is where God wants me to be. And then as soon as, as, soon as I did that, suddenly a new job just kind of fell in my lap. And all of these things just started happening. It's like when, when I was content with what God had given me, that's when, that's when everything started moving forward. When I was trying to do things on my own, nothing was happening. I, 
I think this, it, this, this, it happens this way with, with all sorts of things. When, when we wait for God, He comes through. When we act impulsively, we just spin our wheels. So, here's maybe one way to think about it. Doing the Lord's work, living His life, means that we are both ready and patient. We have to be ready to do what God gives us to do and willing to do it. But we also have to be patient because God's time is not always our time. We might feel antsy, but that doesn't mean that God wants us to take that step just yet. He'll give us opportunities if we can be patient so that it's by His power and for His glory. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're thankful for Jesus Christ. We're thankful for all that that means for us, the forgiveness of sins and the repentance into a new life. Lord, we pray that we would apply that message to our hearts, that we would repent, and that, Lord, we would accept your your forgiveness, that we would forgive ourselves, that we would forgive others. Lord, that, that our lives would be changed by Jesus Christ, and that we would have a story to tell, that we would be witnesses of these things, and that, Lord, we would share that message. Lord, we're so grateful, and we pray that we would live out that gratefulness. In the name of Jesus, amen.